Well, thanks, Molly. Thanks, everybody. Um, thanks for having me and to everybody there. I guess um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Um, I'm here to talk to you today um, about textile. I work at uh, a, I wor I've worked at textile for a few years now. You can find us at textile.io. We're an open source company that uh, we're focused on making data a first class citizen uh, on the World Wide Web. Um, you know, I think one thing that really inspired us is actually an old quote by Juan. I, I don't remember where it was from, but uh, he said a lot of people were focused on creating different gauges of the railroad in the early days of the of rail, um, and it really uh, and railroad really took off when people focus on standardizing the gauge. And that's something that I run through my head a lot is that in on the internet and especially in uh, Web3 and the decentralized web, it's time to really start focusing on the standard gauge so that we can all build together and build really awesome and amazing things. So um, Textile is really focused on uh, a handful of technologies that um, connect and extend libp2p, IPFS, Filecoin in useful ways for app builders and, uh, and services. And today I really wanna to talk to you about two of those technologies, um, threads and buckets. Um, and then tomorrow I'll be talking about our work to link in Filecoin through a technology called the PowerGate. So hopefully you can join for that as well. But so to jump right in, because I have a lot of, a lot of things I wanna share with you, um, I wanna focus on the first technology, which is called ThreadsDB, or sometimes just Threads for short. Uh, Threads really uh, is a technology that rose out of some what we called our field studies, actually trying to build applications on uh, on the IPFS network and realizing where some areas that we could build um, helpful technologies for other people that wanted to do the same thing. And so ThreadsDB is a peer-to-peer -peer database built on IPFS, libp2p, IPNS, IPLD. It's really uh, helping to sandwich and stack those technologies and then, uh, and then create an interface for developers that's really easy to use. So we're really focused on delivering kind of a MongoDB-like developer interface. So when a developer wants to put a database in their application, they don't necessarily want to think about how they can stack and sandwich all those protocols. They really just want to start using them. And so a very simple starting interface. Um, but then it gives some modular uh, components like ACL, identity, CRDTs that developers can plug and play um, what they need to make their application run. Uh, and then finally, uh, it's, it, it has an encrypt, encryption first design that enables um, private sharing with third party services being added uh, as well. And I'll get deeper into that because I think that's where this gets really useful for this audience. Um, so just really quick going inward to thread threads, I'll talk about the database here first. And so um, every thread, which is kind of the network has a database, which is the local component. Um, and these, these uh, terms might sound familiar. Actually, I hope they sound familiar is that when a developer creates a database, a database has many collections. Collections are the schemas that define what's going to be in that database. Um, inside of a collection, there can be many instances. Uh, so the objects or the documents that you're storing in that database that fulfill those schemas. And then those instances are what you can add, delete, and update once you have your database. And so on the left, I have some code here that's using the JavaScript library to create a collection of astronauts um, with some fields and then update and query those fields in a very familiar looking way and uh, trying to help the developer not necessarily have to be thinking about you know content addresses that are constantly changing and how they can manage this mutable data that's actually running uh, over IPFS. But then where Threads is probably uh, really powerful is the networking. And so there's a couple of things I wanted to just point out about the networking um, to, so that you can start getting your heads around uh, how this is working and what's different and new here. So when we started building uh, at Textile, we, uh, we started trying to build applications that would run in the browser and mobile devices um, and in just real network conditions. And when you build a peer-to-peer -peer application, one of the first and kind of the default ways that you're going to architect it is that say you are peer A and you have some data or, or update that you want to send to peer B, you would push it. And this is where libp2p is fantastic. They can connect to each other and push these updates. But what often happens is um, 
is that, that that's going to break down in real network conditions where B is offline or A is online only for a small amount of time, especially in mobile applications where you can imagine that the app is only actually connected to the internet for a small fraction of the day. And so the next thing that we layered in is allowing the network to pull updates. So if A tries to make a, a change to the data and B comes on later, it can attempt to pull those updates from A and that's baked into the networking so the developer doesn't have to think too much about it. But then again, really, really uh, uh, interesting to this audience, I think is the third um, component which allows a push and pull architecture. So if A tries to make an update uh, and B is not online, A can actually assume that they're going to be offline the next time B comes online. And so they're not actually going to be available for the pull request. And so what they do instead is they can push those updates to a third party service, Z. And then some time can pass and B can come online and knowing, uh, knowing that Z is available, they can actually pull the updates that they missed. And so what we've tried to do here is take some of the things that that sort of technologists learned by making web 2 run really well and actually apply them to the web 3 space and so what i mean by that is actually allowing services and apis to be stood up uh, in a way that applications can be built on them and scaled but they don't have to abandon the idea of letting uh, users own their data or creating interoperable data sets or private key infrastructure. And so what this does, and I'll, I'll show you how this actually works in a, at a more technical level, it lets end users own their data, it lets developers provision services on the network that then those end users can make use of without abandoning, uh, abandoning their ownership and their privacy. So yeah, so ThreadsDB really lets people, uh, lets end users do more with private data and soon public data. And so this is kind of an overview graph of what's happening when you make a, a change to your local database and then how it can propagate to the network and some multi, uh, multi-layered encryption that's going to happen to the data. Um, the left side is, is sort of what is user owned and controlled and private and the right side is where threads enables third party services. And if, you, if you're building a pinning service, if you wanna build APIs for end users, that service key that's mentioned in the upper right hopefully is making your ears ring that this might be an interesting opportunity of, of something that you can build on. So just a quick flow here uh, on the bottom left, the user creates some raw data. The first thing that's going to happen is um, the, the, uh, the, the applicant or sorry, the uh, library is going to create a symmetric private key for that data or sorry, just a symmetric key for that data that um, will encrypt it one time use key. Um, and you don't have to follow this. This is just for if, if, for those of you that have kind of your head around this already. But the next step that's going to happen is there's a shared read read key. So all participants in a thread who are collaborating on the same data set can share this read key. And so that will then encrypt the body, the encrypted body from the previous step and the key. Uh, and then you want to share that out to the participants so they can open it up and see what you've updated in the data set. But the next thing that's going to happen is actually you're going to wrap that one more time with some metadata that links it to the previous updates and then one more layer of encryption with what's called this service key. And so with the service key, you can't see anything inside the data, but you can see how the data links uh, across uh, updates. So you can do really interesting things like surface APIs that allow paging or uh, time based lookups. Um, you can see some basic metadata so that you can ensure you're providing services to users that are authenticated to use that service, um, but you can actually see what's happening inside. And so that's where the service key comes in. And I can share the service key for my data set with any service that I have a level of trust that I think that they'll give me a service that I want. So for example, archiving or making it available on the IPFS network. So left side, user owned, right side, available for services to build on in a really interesting and open way with these, uh, what, and, and the threads DB concept allows you to think about these like interoperable data sets. So once it's user owned, if there are people that are standing up services or there are different applications that are using these schemas, the user can pull them back out and put them in new applications. And what this does is it allows you to build applications that you don't have to ask the user to run their own nodes as a first step. You don't have to ask the user to do the overhead of, of actually joining other networks besides just using your app. Um, but you leave that door open. So as they become more involved, as they become more interested, they can find new ways to make sure their data lives forever or make sure their data lives in other applications and they get the most out of it. And so I think really interesting uh, in the pinning service or the pinning summit uh, uh, context 
is that threads are actually dynamic pin sets. So I'll, I'll get into our some of our hosted services that we're making available to developers. Um, but really, you can think about updates to your database. You want to persist them off of your phone, or you want to persist them out of your browser on some IPFS node that's going to be online longer. And so what you do is you can take this service key, you can push your, your thread updates to these third-party services that are running IPFS nodes, and they can make sure that data is pinned as a pin set across the entire thread. And I'll share these slides, but um, some important links about threads. We have a white paper. It's, it's actually a work in progress. Um, and so, but you can really dig into some of the technical pieces about how this comes together. Um, and then we have a couple of implementations for using the database and networking and, um, and different pieces inside of that. And so that brings me to my, uh, my, the next piece I wanted to talk about, which, uh, which are buckets. Uh, buckets are really the first application built on ThreadsDB. Um, and what we, what we started realizing is that once you have the thread, once you have this really kind of quick, lightweight database that can be moving data around with multiple use, users collaborating, one thing that you might want to do is actually just move around dynamic folders on IPFS. And so what threads are, are basically, uh, or sorry, what buckets are, are basically a thread that tracks a changing DAG. And so you have a DAG that the head of it is in the metadata of that, of, of, the, of the instance in the, um, in the database. And as that instance changes, the uh, thread can push those updates out to not only uh, all the peers that are collaborating on that folder of data, but then any services that want to replicate and make that data available faster or in more places on IPFS. And it's really cool here because this is another place that the service key becomes very interesting because you can actually let other services subscribe to changes in your bucket. And so we could build a very push and pull based network where data is changing and moving across the network in really interesting ways. And we could build some pretty incredible things. And this is, this is important beyond just pinning. And this is important just beyond just archiving, you could imagine services that are actually transforming and translating data. Um, and so you could imagine uh, things like audio processing or video processing or reformatting and image sampling um, could be built on top of this. And there's some nuances to the way buckets work in the way that we let, so buckets right now are totally public. Um, we're working right now on having private buckets as well, but because they're totally puppet, public, you can actually share that read key with the service as well, so they can go all the way down into the thread and, and, um, and recursively move through this DAG and do work on top of your data. And in this case right now, it's just the work is pinning and exposing that data, but it might be, like I said, resampling or formatting or other, other operations on your data. So buckets are built on ThreadsDB. So this is really just another interoperable format. Thread buckets are really just a schema. And so if you recall the database part of threads, it's, the, it's threads that have a database. Inside the database are collections. Inside of collections are instances. Buckets are actually each bucket you create, which is a, a different dynamic folder on your disk, is actually just a different instance in a collection. That collection is defined by a schema that is just buckets. Something really cool I think that's happening here is um, the interoperability uh, is, is, uh, is really powerful. And so instances in, in any kind of database you use, you'd, you'd probably have some key, some unique ID for an instance. In this collection, of, uh, in the buckets collection, we've actually made that ID uh, be an IPNS address. And so you already know immediately that instance defines a bucket. It also has this address which is interoperable across all IPFS nodes that are exposing IPNS addresses. Since this bucket is public, I can go to that on any gateway and, and, and share the content of this. Um, so that's really exciting. And, and there's a lot of opportunity to do more with that and different kinds of schemas that we can build that are beyond buckets that use the same property to add interoper interoperability and uh, expose really cool features. We have, a, we have a client, which I'll talk about next, that lets you create buckets and push them to remote IPFS peers quickly. Here I'm pushing a folder of four files to a remote IPFS peer in a one-liner. Um, and then I'm gonna go to a gateway. I'm gonna, oh, first I'm gonna ask for all the links and you'll see one of them is an IPNS link. And I can grab that and go to the gateway on Textile and look at that IPS, I, IPNS link and there's my web page. And I can go to that on other gateways as well. So um, 
we have a lot of work to do still on just making buckets bigger and better and more. Um, like I said, we're working on private buckets. So that would be the content encrypted. Um, we're working with um, a few different people to also support buckets and have interoperability on other services. Same with threads. Um, and obviously we're working on Filecoin and I'll, I'll talk more about that tomorrow. But the idea here is that um, threads and buckets would also be supported on endpoints that can do um, storage and persistence on the Filecoin network. And that gets really super exciting too, because then we just add another protocol that's all interop interoperable with these data sets. And so some um, interesting links for you. We have documentation about buckets on the doc, on the textile docs, um, and we have a bunch of different blog posts about um, about buckets and, and how to put them to use. And we'll be doing some more. We just actually, the piece I'll talk about next about the hub, we just launched that. And so we're still adding a lot of content there. Um, and, um, and But I'll, I'll share with you some of the early bits of it. So yeah, so that gets me to the third piece of technology, the hub. Um, and the hub is is where um, what we were trying to do is is, is just reduce the, um, the cost uh, for developers to really come and experiment and build things. Uh, I think that reduction in, in the experimentation cost is the most important KPI for developer tooling and for us building on the network. Um, and we, what we want to do is make it easy for developers to come explore, test, and fail quickly so that they can go and test and build the next thing and really test their ideas on this thing because it's only if we can get a thousand developers or tens of thousand developers to come and be testing and building that we can have the sparks that really take off through society uh, and really make this uh, 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 make some really big and impactful successes. And so let's try to lower that cost of adoption and the, the cost of, um, of of failure. And um, so the hub really does that. And and like I said, the hub is is really just a set of open source technologies that include threads and and um, bucket support and some uh, IPFS nodes. And so really, if there's are there if there are pieces in here that you're running services and you want to run these on your own, we're happy to help and walk you through and and share with you what we've done here. Um, but so when you go and grab the CLI for the hub, you can create things like accounts, you can create things like organizations so that you can share administrative uh, tooling with other collaborators. Um, and you can invite people to those organizations. And so here I'll create my conifers and I'll invite an astronaut to my conifers organization. And that means I can create buckets and teams, that, uh, buckets and threads that are um, collaboratively edited and managed by this team. But that's for developers. Um, and I had mentioned early on that we have this idea of developers can provision space. So this is this is a developer provisioning space on the hub, and that will give them hosted IPFS resources that will give them access to these networks and protocols through some persistent nodes. Um, but what we really want to do is let them then pass that on to their users in a way that their users still own their data. And so I'll get into that in a second. Um, the hub has hosted IPFS services, thread services, has gRPC endpoints. We have some different clients available, um, and uh, and it really focuses on this idea of um, uh, interoperability, but offering an easy onboarding for for end users. But probably the most interesting thing here is the way that we do the access to those resources. So the developer in the uh, in the preview I just showed you was setting up an account um, with their other developer team when they want to use the APIs, they can actually get what's called an account key and that account key will grant them access to everything that they're doing in the CLI. So they can create buckets, they can create new databases that are totally um, owned and controlled by them as a developer or the organization that they created in. But they can also create what's called a user key and a user key can will grant access to the API um, uh, using the resources of that developer, but in a way that lets the end user own and control that data. And so this uses PKI so that um, end users who are creating threads in an application or creating buckets in an application are actually pushing that data against the API, but it's all encrypted and private to both um, the developer and to textile. So then these users have an easy onboarding, they get their data on persistent IPFS nodes, um, but they can actually just use IPFS in their, in their private key to get it back out uh, and or, or replicate it on their own nodes or in the future as other services come online, get it into other services. And we think that's um, really cool and interesting. We're, we're working with um, identity providers to, to make sure that this is interoperable and lets um, users choose the 
identity that they want to use here. Um, or if users don't care, they just want to use the application or service, they can just use it. Um, and so, um, so yeah, our focus with the hub is really to create uh, uh, services for dynamic, interoperable, and disintermediated intermediated data. And what I mean, what I mean uh, in this context by disintermediated is that a developer can come and use the hub and get access to these resources, but then they can get themselves out of the way when they put them in, put the resources into their application. So it's really then just a relationship uh, between the end user and the hosted interface. But using threads, it's interoperable data formats, it's PKI, um, so the end user really owns it, and they're just more or less borrowing some space provided by the developer on the hub. Um, and if you want to use these things, if you want to try to build them into your app, uh, let us know. We have a Slack channel, slack.textile.io. We're always available trying to help people. A lot of the pieces on the hub are early, so there's, we're, we're sort of filling in examples, we're filling in um, documentation, but if you have specific use cases and want help, just let us know. We're working as fast as we can. Um, and we also hope that other services want to adopt these things and build on it. So let us know if you're on that side and, um, and we're down to help. And so those are the kind of, those are, I, I kind of covered really three technologies here. And like I said, tomorrow I'll talk about the power gate, but kind of to leave the, my presentation off here, I, I, I wanted to like step back and just talk about the bigger picture because I am really excited to present at the Pinning, Pinning Summit. Um, but one thing I got thinking about when I was putting these slides together um, is that Textile was just born in a totally different time. Um, we were, you know, we're obviously focused on helping people work with decentralized protocols. We're really focused on making data something that people can own and um, can persist on the online for long periods of time. But really, um, things are changing right now. And, and the things that are changing may never go back to the way they normally were. And we want to find people that are trying to build technologies for that new world. Um, and importantly, are trying to um, build technologies that will bring positive impact to that new world. So if you're, if you're building technology that brings people together, or you're building technology that keeps people safe, or you're building technology that just makes a brighter future through access to healthcare, access to education, um, better access to information, we really want to support you right now. Um, so don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, we're here to provide resources and uh, you know, time uh, and, and anything you really need to make these applications beautiful and shine right now. Um, and that whole new world that's coming and that we're seeing the transition is also a big opportunity. And so we want to help you get there. So just let us know. And with that, um, thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you so much, Andrew. This is phenomenal. Um, do folks have any questions for Andrew? Feel so free to stick them in Q&A or in the chat. Threads and buckets are awesome. I was just reading, rereading the Threads paper um, last night. So super, super cool work there. And thank you all for the amazing tooling that you're building on IPFS. It's amazing. Yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, it's just so much, so much protocol labs and the things we do. Uh, you really do awesome things. And the 050 launch is incredible. And we're um, so excited to see everything just coming together. And 2020 is going to be such an awesome year. Already is. That one from Pooja. Can buckets be integrated into other services too? How would this work? Yeah, absolutely. So there's kind of a couple concepts going on in buckets. The the primary thing is that it's really just a schema in a in a threads DB. So threads DB is just a, a, a kind of like a, a set of protocols and some some opinions about how the layers of encryption should work and then how you share those keys. Um, and so what what that would take for other services to support buckets would really be to support threads and then to agree upon some some schemas that they're going to they're going to call buckets so buckets are really our first version um, we'll we'll definitely publish some documentation on what that looks like and what the spec is for a bucket um, but it's pretty simple right now it's really just a basic document that has the CID of the head of the folder and then it has some unix fs type pinning behind the scenes to make sure that that folder is persistent um, but it's pretty straightforward and so if you're building things like a pinning service it shouldn't be it shouldn't be um, out of the park also the um, way services run is they're actually baked into the um, the the um, reference implementation our go threads implementation so you can already you can already use that library to stand up your own services and to accept uh, things like other threads to follow 
Uh, and so that's all there. And actually the binary has it as well. So you can run the threads D binary and, and build services on that. It's underdocumented. It is, it's kind of like the next thing we need to document after getting people to use these things, but it will come and it's, it's there. So if you have questions, jump into our GitHub repo and, and just fire off some tickets. Looks like you have a question from Cody in the Q&A. How do public gateways know how to read and present buckets? Are the folders represented as Unix FS? Exactly, yeah. The folders are Unix FS. And um, right now, um, I had mentioned that buckets are, are only open. And because they're open, the, uh, the authors of a bucket don't really care about uh, the read key. So they actually just share the read key. When we have open threads, you wouldn't need to do that. But right now, threads are only encrypted. Um, and so what they do is they just, uh, the bucket owner will just share the read key with the, with the hub. In this, in this case, it, the hub is, you can just think of it like the gateway. And because of that, that gateway knows how to go and look in the thread as a thread service, but then it also can see that CID because it has the read key, and then it will just it will just pin that Unix FS folder. Um, and there's a lot of enhancements we can do there, and we're working on a lot of those things. So, um, But it, it's working really well right now. Uh, so did I understand correctly that threads are per user encrypted by default now and that you will support non-encrypted stuff later? Is non-encrypted already possible? So um, so there, that gets into some pretty deep technical things. So the thing that's really novel and interesting around threads is it's actually a, a thread is a collection of single writer logs that then have, um, have a, a modular CR, CRDT that turn that into a database. Each of those logs is privately uh, is privately owned by each user. Uh, and then the encryption is happening through a symmetric key per update. And so they're just generated each time there's an update. And then that is encrypted after some things with the read key, which is shared with everybody. All the different logs that are pushing to that database share that read key. Uh, and all of that is default. So that, that all that encryption is happening. Um, and we're looking at ways to unlock that. So you could have a totally open um, uh, thread that people could read. But also threads could support things like single writer, many reader, um, and, and many, many writer scenarios. Thank you all.